Shabby! Shabby! Capital, my dear Watson. Let us return to our humble abode. Um, uh, 221 B Baker Street, please, Gary. From London, we present The Greek Interpreter, a Sherlock Holmes story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, dramatized for radio by Michael Hardwick. The Greek Interpreter. Of course, I quite agree with you, Holmes. Any individual owes a great deal of his gifts, if he has any, to his ancestry, uh, to heredity. But what about your own case? My case, Watson? Well, from all you've ever told me, it seems obvious that your remarkable faculties of observation and deduction come almost entirely from your own systematic training. You didn't inherit them. Now, now, did you? To some extent, yes, I think so. Well, <laughs> Oh, my ancestors were country squires. They led much the same life as the rest of their class. Mm. But remember, Watson, my grandmother was the sister of Verne, the French artist. What's that got to do with it? Ah, art in the blood is liable to take the strangest forms. <laughs> Agreed. But what makes you think that in your case it is accounted for such unusual gifts? Because my brother, Mycroft, possesses them too. Your brother? Yes. Yeah. Holmes, in all the time we've known one another, this is the first mention you've ever made of having a brother. Really? Perhaps I should have referred to him before. Oh. <laughs> Holmes, Holmes, shall I ever get used to your ways? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, Mycroft has my gift. In fact, to a greater degree. I think that's about the first time I've heard you being modest. Not at all. Nothing was further from my intention. I cannot agree with those who rank modesty amongst the virtues. When I say that Mycroft has better powers of observation than I, you may take it that I'm speaking the exact and literal truth. Mm -hmm. It's also true that he has neither the energy nor the ambition to use them in the way I do. Where is he? Is he your junior? Oh, seven years my senior. How comes it that one never hears anything about him? Oh, he's very well known in his own circle. Well, then? Well, in his club, for example. Oh, look here, it's just six o'clock now. Mycroft's always there from a quarter to five to twenty to eight. If you'd care for a stroll this beautiful evening, Watson, I'll be very happy to introduce you. Well, I'd be very pleased to meet you, Brother Holmes. Just let me ring for our boots and I'm ready right away. Ah, oh, my dear Watson, this is my brother Mycroft. Mycroft, my friend and associate, Dr. Watson. Delighted to meet you, sir. And I'm glad to meet you, Dr. Watson. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became his chronicler. Oh, you're too kind. Yeah, well, now, let us all have a seat by the window. Yes, delighted. Yes. Uh, to anyone who wishes to study mankind, this is the spot. Ah, it's certainly a splendid view of the street. Yes. Look at the magnificent types in it. Uh, look there, those two men coming along now. Mm. Uh, you mean the billiard marker and the other? Billiard marker, Holmes? How can you tell that? Well, the chalk marks on his waistcoat pocket. Of course. Oh. Mm. An old soldier, too, I perceive. <laughs> really, now, you, you, you fellows, this, this is too much. Surely, Watson, it isn't hard to say that a man with that bearing and expression of authority is a soldier. Well... By the way, Sherlock, I've had something quite after your own heart. Oh? Yes, quite a singular problem's come my way. My dear Mycroft, I'd be delighted to hear it. Yes, I'll just scribble a note for the porter. Uh, be so good as to touch that bell, Dr. Watson, sure, please. Sir, sir. Yes, this won't take a moment. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, give this to Mr. Milas, please. Uh, yes, sir. He's just in the lobby now, sir. Ah, good. I've asked Mr. Milas to step in here. He's a Greek by extraction, lodges on the floor above me, but I only know him slightly. I understand he's a remarkable linguist. He earns his living by interpreting in the law courts and acting as a guide to wealthy Orientals. <laughs> ah, then here is Mr. Milas. How good of you to step in, my dear sir. It is my now, pleasure, sir. Allow me to introduce my celebrated brother, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and his associate, Dr. Watson. Ah, how do you do? Let me less be true. My dear Mr. Holmes, I cannot say how delighted I am to meet you. And you too, Dr. Watson. I am honored, gentlemen, honored. The honor is ours, Mr. Milas. My brother was beginning to tell us about a most singular problem. 
when he paused to summon you. And I can only assume that you are in some way concerned in it. Ah, yes, yes, alas. If you wish to submit the details to me, I shall be only too happy to listen to them. To tell you the truth, Mr. Holmes, I believe I shall be able to rest much more easily after telling this strange tale to you and Dr. Watson. Then I am all attention. Uh, this is Wednesday evening. Well, then, it was on Monday night that all this happened. Uh, perhaps Mr. Mycroft Holmes has told you. I am an interpreter. Uh, yes, yes. I am often sent for at strange hours on behalf of foreigners who get into difficulties. So I was not very surprised on Monday night when a very fashionably dressed young man came up to my rooms. Mr. Miller, my name is Latimer. I've had a rather unexpected visit from a Greek gentleman with whose firm I have some business dealings. I see. Well, the trouble is, he can't speak anything but Greek. Oh, yes? Well, it's a bit late, I realize, but, uh, well, he's a complete stranger to London, and I, I must do what I can for him straight away, you know, fix him up with a hotel for tonight and so on. So I took the liberty of coming to see if uh, you'd help at all. Well, of course. Thank you. Oh, but uh, tell me, Mr. Latimer, have you your friend with you now? Well, no, actually. <laughs> Silly of me, I suppose, but, well, he was pretty tired, and I left him at my place, and without thinking, really, I just jumped into a cab and came here. Oh, but... but it's only this end of Kensington, and I wondered if I could impose on you to come back with me. Well, I suppose... The cab's outside. It's not far at all. Very well, then, Mr. Latimer. I shall be very pleased to help you. Or perhaps you will help yourself to one of the cigarettes while I put on my things. You were lucky, I think, to find a vehicle as pleasant as this for your errand, Mr. Latimer. <laughs> yes, these old four-wheelers are getting a bit faded at the edges. Forgive me them sooner than a handsome any time. I like some privacy when I travel. Oh, very convenient at times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but look... Look, look, our cabby has made some mistake. He must know this is not the way to Kensington. I think he has misheard your directions, Mr. Latimer. I'm afraid he hasn't. What are you doing? Oh, why are you drawing the blinds? Mr. Latimer, what is the meaning of this? I'm sorry to cut off your view, Mr. Miller. The fact is, we're not going to Kensington, and I prefer you not to know where we are going. How dare you, sir? I insist on leaving this carriage at once. Sit down, Mr. Miller. I have a life preserver here, and I shan't hesitate to use it if you cry out or try anything on. You, you think you can do this? Remember, Mr. Miller, no one knows you are here. This cabby will ask no questions. Whether you're in here or in the place I'm taking you to, you're equally in my power, you understand? Uh, I understand. Then sit still, keep quiet, and remember that no harm will come to you if you continue to do everything I say. We drove on like that for something like two hours, Mr. Holmes. It was ten minutes to nine by my watch when we came to a standstill. I was hurried out of the carriage and through a low arched doorway with a lamp burning above it. I had a vague impression of lawn and trees on each side, and then I was inside the house. I was shown straight into a room. There was a middle-aged man with glasses sitting in a velvet chair. He turned towards us as I was brought into the room. Ah, Harold, is this the gentleman, Mr. Millers? Yes. Well done, well done. No ill will, Mr. Millers, I hope, but we just couldn't get on without you. If you deal fair with us, you'll not regret it. But if you try any tricks... I protest most strongly against this illegal detention. Uh, the police shall know of it, I warn you. What we ask of you is simplicity itself. We want you to ask a few questions of a Greek gentleman who is um, visiting us and tell us his answers. Harold, perhaps you'd ask the gentleman to step in here. Very good. Well, nothing sinister in that, Mr. Miller, is there? Then why this disgraceful conduct towards me? Well, answer that, sir. Regretted, sir, regretted. Now, let us look at it this way. You were ready enough to accept an evening's commission in return for your usual fee. You will have your fee, Mr. Millers, and double. You will carry out your commission in exchange. You will then be taken back to London. Oh, very well. I am here. I will do as you ask. So long as it accords with my normal services. Nothing more, though. You, you understand? 
Agreed. <laughs> ah, and now there will be no more waste of time. Here is Harold with our guest. At that moment, Mr. Holmes, the other man, Latimer, came back. He was leading a gentleman wearing some sort of loose dressing gown. As this man came slowly forward into the dim circle of light, I was horrified at his appearance. He was deadly pale and emaciated. He, he had the protruding eyes of one whose spirit is greater than his strength. But what shocked me more than anything else, there was a great pad of sticking plaster over his mouth. A gag? Yes, a gag. I see. Pray continue, Mr. Miller. The younger man gave him a chair and then put a slate and a slate pencil into his hands. Then the older one gave me questions to ask him, and he was to write the answers on the slate. Can you remember them? Oh, very well. Splendid. But I must first tell you something, Mr. Holmes. As I was about to begin, a happy thought came to me. Yes? As the other two men in the room obviously knew nothing of the Greek language, I decided that I would be quite safe in interpolating questions of my own among those I was directed to ask. And by this means, I might be able to find out who the captive was and why he was there, and I might even have been able to help him. Capital, capital, eh, Michael? Uh, I knew you'd be pleased about that, Sherlock. Mr. Milas is an invaluable witness, is he not? He is indeed. Let us proceed, Mr. Milas. You were to ask the questions, he was to write the answers. I will try to give you the, the gist of the interview so far as the significant parts went. I began as directed. I am directed to ask whether you are prepared to sign the papers. On no conditions? You know what is in store for you, then? The property can never be yours. What is your name? You shall go free if you sign. Where are you from? Then I warn you again. What house is this? I found that his name was Kratidis and that he came from Athens. He, he didn't know where he was and they were starving him. Another five minutes, Mr. Holmes, and I might have succeeded in getting the whole story out of him. You did remarkably well, Mr. Milas. I congratulate you. Oh, splendid, splendid. Yes, I, I thought I should discover it all under their very noses. Only at that instant the door opened and a woman stepped into the room. I couldn't see her very clearly in the dim light, but I think she was tall and dark and wearing a sort of loose white gown. Oh, Harold, I couldn't stay up there any longer. It is so lonely with all... Paul! Paul! It is Paul! Get hold of her, Harold. Quick, Paul. get back there. Paul! Get him right. Right, I've got her. come to you. No! 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 <sighs> Well, Mr. Milas, I'm sorry we couldn't have spared you that distressing scene, but whatever you're thinking about all this, you're quite wrong. Quite wrong, I assure you. Here are five sovereigns. Take them. Now, the carriage will take you back to town. But remember one word of this to a human soul, and don't think we haven't our means of knowing if you talk. We'll soon know about it. And that is all, gentlemen. I was bundled into the carriage, and it drove off at a great rate. It was much too dark to see anything outside. After a long time, it stopped, and I was told to get down. But before I could look round me, the coachman was back into his seat and whipping up the horse. I was left alone. How did you get back home, then? I walked for a while, Dr. Watson. Then I met a man who told me I was on Wandsworth Common and pointed out the way to Clapham Junction. Mm. I got there in time for the last train to Victoria. The next day, I told the whole story to Mr. Mycroft Holmes here. Well, Mycroft, anything to add? Only this in today's daily news. 
Anybody supplying any information as to the whereabouts of a Greek gentleman named Paul Cretides from Athens who is unable to speak English will be rewarded. A similar reward will be paid to anyone giving information about a Greek lady whose first name is Sophie. A box number, etc., etc. I had that put in all the dailies. No answer, though. How about the Greek legation? No, they know nothing. A wire to the Athens police, then. Sherlock has all the energy of the family, you see, gentlemen. <laughs> Who is he? Well, you take over the case by all means, my dear brother. Let me know if you do any good. Certainly. A word of warning, though, Mr. Miles. I should certainly be on my guard if I were you. They'll have seen those advertisements. They'll know you portrayed them. I should be very careful indeed. Have you your key, Watson? Yes. <coughs> Let me... <sighs> ah, splendid. Mrs. Hudson has left us a fine fire to... Great heavens! Mycroft! How did you get here? My handsome passed you on the way. Well, do come in and make yourselves comfortable, gentlemen. <laughs> yes, you don't expect such energy from me, do you, Sherlock? It is a trifle uncharacteristic. The fact is, I've had an answer. Your advertisement? Yes, came just after you two had left. I thought you'd want to see it at once. We do indeed. Uh, here it is. Uh, written with a J pen on royal cream paper by a middle-aged man with a weak constitution. Not two of you. Uh, sir, he says, in answer to your advertisement of today's date, I beg to inform you that I have met the young lady in question several times in this district. She is still living, to the best of my knowledge, at the Myrtles Beckenham. Yours faithfully, J. Davenport. Uh, there, Sherlock. She might be able to tell you something more, don't you think? My dear Mycroft, I'm most grateful to you. And to Mr. Davenport, for that matter. But I think we'll see him later. In the meantime, we know that a man is being gradually done to death, and the sooner we get to him, the better. Well, you'll go straight to the Martles, then? Yes. Come along, Watson. Are you coming, Mycroft? Well, uh, if you don't mind, I think not. It's, uh, it's rather late for me, you know. No need for excuses. I understand. Ready, Watson? Ready, Holmes. <clears throat> I think I'll take my revolver. They sound a dangerous lot, and I think we'll call up the yard. Inspector Gregson should be interested in this. Uh, perhaps we'd be wise to pick up Mr. Milas, too, Holmes. We may need an interpreter. Quite right. Goodbye, then, Mycroft. Uh, goodbye. goodbye. We'll keep you informed. Yes, gentlemen. We should like a word with Mr. Milas, please. I'm afraid Mr. Milas isn't in, sir. We expected he'd be back from his club by now. Oh, yes, sir. He came back an hour or more ago, but he's gone again. Gone? Gone out, sir, in a carriage. A carriage? You don't mean a cab, do you? No, sir, definitely a carriage. A gentleman called for Mr. Milas, and they went off together. A Mr. Latimer? I didn't get his name, sir. But if you like to wait a moment, I'll find out what I no, can... No, 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 never mind. Good night to you. Good night, sir. They got hold of me less again, Watson. Yes, yeah, looks like it. That means two lives in danger now. Tabby, beckon them as fast as you can go. Well, gal, beckon them it is, gents. Darkness, Inspector. It looks as though our birds have flown and the nest empty, Dr. Watson. Yes. Is it worth going in? It's always better to take a look. You'll never know what we may pick up. Hmm. I can't see much through this window. The place has that deserted air about it, though. You can feel it somehow. Yes, I know what you mean. Hello. Where's Holmes? Well, he was here a minute ago. Must be taking a prowl around. Ah, there he is. Where have you been, Holmes? I've got a window open round here. Come on. It's a good job you're on the side of the force, Mr. Holmes. My little Jimmy saved me a few bruised shoulders in my time. Now, in with you both. Good. And now I'll follow you. 
So far, so good. Now, what have we here? Someone's had a meal in a hurry. There, on the table. A meal for two. Two plates, two glasses. That may be significant. Holmes! What's that? That room in there. Stand aside, Mr. Holmes. Right. Oh, Hugh. Yeah, Watson, hold the lamp. I got it. Got to get in. Open the window. Oh. <coughs> two. <coughs> two in there. Can, can you? Can you get them out? Quick. Leave it to us. Come on, Doctor. Well, down on your knees, Inspector. Give me a little bit. I've got to get out. Oh, pull that way. The charcoal brazier in there. <coughs> and the room was sealed up. It'll soon clear now. Uh, how do you feel, Watson? Oh, not so bad. I'm all right. The draft soon clears it away. Uh, only just in time for these two, I think. No. Not just in time. Are they both? This is me, lads. He's all right, I think. The other's dead. Cretides? The poor devil's been starved to a skeleton. Yes, he can't have had long to last in any case. <laughs> well, I must leave them with you, talking to them for the time being. I must get across to the nearest police station and get things moving to find this Latimer and the other. Though we've little enough to go on at the moment, I fear. And if you'll send someone out here to get poor Cretides' body, Dr. Watson and I will take Mr. Milas back to Baker Street with us. A few more questions when he comes around properly might give us something more to work on. Very good, Mr. Holmes. I'll see you later at Baker Street, then. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I, I don't know how to begin thanking you. Oh. But for your timely arrival... Pray, try to put it from your mind, Mr. Milas. We did arrive in time. Now, what have you to tell us about your second kidnapping? On this occasion, I was not persuaded to go to that house. A life preserver was presented to my head, and I was ordered to go. I was forced to interpret yet another interview with that poor Kratidis. He was much weaker, could scarcely hold the slate pencil. It was impossible for me to communicate secretly with him this time. Uh, what did they want? His signature still? Yes, but the brave fellow refused every threat. They finally saw it was useless and bundled him roughly out of the room. Then they turned on me over the newspaper advertisement. I wonder if your brother was not a little hasty putting that in, Mr. Holmes. Possibly, sir. But remember, Mr. Milas, but for the answer which came so suddenly, we should certainly never have found you. Ah, yes. Well, they left me in no doubt as to their intentions. They were going to kill Kratidis and me, and make good their own escape. And, uh, I suppose, because they thought I should never live to tell it to anyone else, they told me their unsavory story. Ah. Watson, will you be good enough to take a note of this? Uh, Inspector Gregson may find it invaluable. By all means, Holmes. Well, there is not much to it, really. Uh, they told me that the young lady, Sophie, came from a wealthy Grecian family and that she had been on a visit to some friends in England. Over here, she had met the younger of the two villains, Harold Latimer, and he had persuaded her to elope with him. Her friends had immediately informed her brother, Paul Kratidis, in Athens. He had come over here at once, but unfortunately for him, had fallen into the power of Latimer and his associate. Oh, his name, by the way, was Wilson Kemp. Wilson Kemp? Kemp? That rogue? A man of the foulest antecedents. This will make Gregson's task easier. Oh, well, well, uh, Kratidis got into the power of these two, and they set out to starve him into agreeing to sign papers, making over his own and his sister's property to them. As I thought. Uh, they had kept him prisoner without the girl's knowledge, and when she saw him when I first went there, it was the first time she knew of his presence. Yeah. They immediately put her under lock and key, too. Then, when they saw the newspaper advertisement and knew their secret was out, they decided to make a final attempt uh, through me to get Kratidis to sign. He wouldn't, so he and I were to be left to die, while they took the girl away with them and got well clear of the country. Clear of the country? That'll give us some lead as to their route. 
The Channel Port Holmes? Yes. Watson, take your notes and off with you to see Gregson as fast as you can go. There may be time to help. Why, Gregson, this is fortunate indeed. You are drowned as soon as I could, gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Milas. How are you feeling, sir? Oh, much better, thank you, Inspector. Uh, and happy to meet yet another one who helped to save me. Don't mention it, sir. Well, Mr. Holmes? Inspector, Dr. Watson here was just about to hurry round to see you. The villains gave Mr. Milas a complete account of this affair. Well, I've saved you a journey, Dr. Watson, oh. haven't I? In any case, it would have been a pity to waste your time. Waste my time, Inspector? What? You've got them already? In a manner of speaking, sir. Um, come, Inspector. No riddles, please. Sorry, sir. You see, the bodies of the two men were found in their carriage on the outskirts of Folkestone in the early hours of this morning. They had both been stabbed several times. Stabbed? A girl? Not to be seen. Nor the coachman. Though from the way his hat was found at the roadside and tracks led off across a muddy field, he had bolted for his life, afraid of getting the same as his master's. And the knife? Lying in the carriage between the two bodies. Uh, they had quarreled, perhaps. Yes. And perhaps Sophie Kratidis and the coachman both ran away in different directions while those two murdered one another. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could put it that way, I suppose. Perhaps it were better if it were put down to something along those lines. Eh, Inspector? <laughs> much better, Mr. Holmes. Very much better. Yeah. Of course, it's our duty to look for that girl, Sophie Cretides. She might know a somewhat different version of what happened, if she could be persuaded to tell us. Yes. All the same, I think we shall allow one or two cross-channel steamers to sail before we begin looking too hard for her. Agreed, Mr. Holmes? Agreed, Inspector. Mm. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> That was The Greek Interpreter. The radio play was dramatized by Michael Hardwick from the story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Carlton Hobbs played Sherlock Holmes and Norman Sherry, Dr. Watson. The production for the BBC was by Martin C. Webster. <laughs>